Hey guys, Marmalade here. Thanks so much for joining me for the sixth and final video in this series of how to properly and successfully and confidently navigate Section A. Uh, if you recall, the very first video was how to get to the terminus if you're landing in San Diego and you want to try to find out the many ways to get there. Then uh, videos two, three, four, and five were breaking down uh, Section A, which is of course from in Campo, which is the Mexico-California border, northbound 109.5 miles to Warner Springs. Uh, so I broke that down into four different videos and this is the final video which is really just about uh, I think maybe the most important one which is really uh, some stats about um, some of the surveys that they've taken for, from through hikers also some tips and tricks and just thoughts about how to really think about what you're doing before you get started once you in my opinion once you get through section A you'll kind of experience roughly most of the things you need to do between camping and hitching and you know uh, resupply and just things like that and navigating so um uh, I think the, uh, hopefully this series will help you and um, like I said this is an important video because it's more about uh, training and base grade. I have a whole bunch of bullet points that I want to go over with you that will hopefully uh, kind of finalize this whole series and get you going with a good start. Alright so the first thing I want to do is go over some stats that I thought were important for you to know. Uh, a survey they take every year. If you haven't uh, signed up go to Halfway Anywhere. I'll put his link down below in the description box. But he does a very very thorough uh, survey every year of the through hikers and that's where I got some of my stats. I actually chose to do 2019 year because, not because it was the year I went, but it was the last year we had non-COVID, full on, the trail full, uh, like a real year where the stats weren't skewed by COVID. So uh, some of these stats, uh, let, me, let me read them because I'm not gonna memorize them. So I just grabbed a few that I thought were interesting and this will kind of, I think these will kind of surprise you, maybe not if you've seen his surveys, but uh, uh, demographics, 60% male, women 40%, so women are catching up. Uh, it's great to see. Uh, hikers age range. So what I look at is, you know, I'm currently, uh, today is, it's in March 2021 and I'm 58 currently. Uh, when I was attempting my through hike, I was 56. But when you look at the age range, it's really interesting. Uh, I'll just go, I'm gonna spew them out really quickly. Um, under 20 was about a, a percentage and a half. Uh, 20 to 24 was 14.7. Uh, 25 to 29 was 30.13, which is the largest age range, 25 to 29. Uh, 30 to 34 was 17.86. Uh, 35 to 39 was 10.45. 40 to 49, so we jump all the way for 10 years, is 7.65. 50 to 59, which was my age group, which is 9.28. Uh, and the last one, which is uh, 60 to 6, or actually 60 to 69 is 7.65. And actually, uh, just under 1% is over 70. But what I did was I kind of added up uh, 40 and over for the older hikers that are watching this, and it's 25.26. So 25, so a little over a quarter of all the hikers are over 40 years old. The average age is 35, which is interesting because it's, we joke because there's almost no 35 year olds. It seems to be 20 somethings and 50 and 60 somethings, which averages 35. But anyway, that's a kind of an interesting thing to look at. Uh, one of the questions I liked was, is this your first long distance hike? 68% said yes. Um, also, this is another one because I know there's some fear out there uh, going by yourself. Uh, how many began their through hike alone? 64.7%, so almost 65%, that's a lot. I did. Uh, the average length uh, of a completed through hike is 155 days northbound and 100, 129 southbound. So I guess it's, for some reason, it's faster so Boeing. Um, then I, I picked like the top four reasons why people didn't complete their hike, why they got a trail. 30%, uh, the number one was injury, which is how I got a trail. 24.9% uh, is just personal reasons, 21.6% is snow, maybe they just couldn't finish and quit, and then 5.1% is financial. I know I, it seems like financial is the higher one, people don't plan uh, properly and don't really get what it's going to cost, but anyway, so those are some of the stats that I thought were kind of important and interesting, so um, like I said, I would check it out before you go. Uh, they did one for last year, and once you sign up and you get an email list, you will, if you uh, say you're through hiking, You'll get the survey and you can, if you say you're, you're uh, through hiking this year, you'll get a survey and you can do it uh, after the end of this year. And uh, it really helps the hikers and, and, and it's great to see the pr progression like with more female hikers and just things like that. All right, so the first couple of bullet points I had were uh, they kind of go together. Uh, the first one is training and the other one is miles per day. So uh, the thing I see all the time is people just, you know, they have this... Uh, 
fantasy of doing the PCT, but they don't really know if they haven't done a through hike, they don't know what they're in for. Uh, they might bike, might look into gear and stuff, but they don't actually train. I know people that live in flatter areas where they can't train for elevation up and down. So, you know, that's, there's nothing you can do about that, but it's really, really imperative that if you can at all to train and to hike and get yourself in pretty good shape and more than the physical part of it, because yes, if you're 22 years old, you can get on trail and you're probably already in decent shape, but you can hike yourself into shape. Uh, some people uh, don't want to train. I don't know if they're lazy, but they just think they're going to do it. But it makes it much more difficult and unenjoyable, really, to be honest with you. But the thing that I, I, I stress all the time to people is that I found that was a surprise to me is that, yes, if you train and you hike, you'll get in better shape. But what happened for me was the mental side of it. I was so much more tough because of all the... And I got I lucky because I live in San Diego and I... I started backpacking as a beginner on the PCT in, in the desert section. So my perspective maybe is different, you know, because I, I knew what I was in for when I started my through hike. But you guys train wherever you live. Just do what you can. And then a couple things so that you will become stronger mentally because you're going to have, you know, the saying, embrace the suck. You're going to have days that suck. And I had a lot of those days. Never once thought of quitting because, you know, it was a bad day. But I know it's just a bad day. And you get to the next day and the next day is a great day. So I, because of all the training and all the, days I'd hiked on the PCT before I did my through hike, I knew that I was going to have days like that and it didn't make me want to shut it down. I just, I just knew get through the day, get a good night's sleep and keep going. Uh, one of the ways I suggest you train too is, uh, obviously if you're out of shape and you're just trying to, you know, maybe you're going in 2022, so you have a year to go. If you're, if you're one of those people, uh, I would suggest, you know, start with your day pack, bring some, you know, food and water and different changes of clothing, depending on the time of year and the weather. But what I would do is phase into your backpack because not only do people not train, but they don't put the full weight and the and the, actually just the the way the backpack feels on your body when you're moving and when you're hiking. And what I would do is if you feel like you're not in great shape, don't load it all the way up. I would just literally put uh, your snacks and your food in that, but get the full pack. And then maybe you throw your cook it in and then you throw some clothes and then you throw your tent. And I would work your way up and slowly add, you know, uh, maybe more water too. So that gets some weight, but add your gear in there till you have the full backpack of gear you just think about it, it's a bonus if you've been hiking and hiking and hiking with your full weight of your backpack on your back and you get to the pct it's not going to be like a learning process it's just another day that you've carried your backpack that's how it was for me and um so the training kind of goes hand in hand with miles per day you have to listen to your body you you have to be open and be flexible because yeah you can say i'm doing 20 every day or i'm doing five every day whatever it is but it's not going to happen that way you're going to get to five and you still have five hours of light, you're gonna go, oh, I'm gonna go to 10 miles, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna go 20 every day, and you end up, you know, you're super leg weary or something, and you stop shorter, so be flexible. I always carried about half a day's extra food if I uh, could help it, just in case I ever got caught in a storm, or a section took a little longer, I thought I could stretch out my food and I was good, or if I got really hungry, I had extra food, but I tried to get my food dialed in, but I also carried a half a day's of food in case I didn't uh, stay right on schedule, and I tried not to get hung up on that. You know, I make a plan, and hopefully it works, but if it doesn't, it doesn't. So in the last part of that um, miles per day is, you know, is pick pick something reasonable. Uh, some of the kids will just go out and start doing 20s, and before you know it, their knees hurting, their hamstrings hurting, all that stuff. Just pick a, uh, you want to do, especially if you leave early enough, you have a decent amount of time to take your time, right, and some zeros. So just take what you think you can do right away. If it's 10, do 10 every day and then ramp up. That's what I did. I did. Uh, I started at 15 miles. I was hiking a lot and I'd hiked the PCT, especially section A a lot. So I knew what I was getting into. So, uh, I, I planned on 15, roughly 15, 15 miles a day. And I didn't take a zero. I did the whole section A. I didn't take a zero. I didn't go to Julian or anywhere. I had one. Um, so I did it in seven days and then I took my zero at Warner Springs. Um, there's plenty of places to resupply what I did. If you want to kind of follow what I did, I carried about two and a half days. I knew it was getting, Mount Laguna is mile 43. I knew I was getting there in about two and a half days. So I carried two and a half days of food. And even though I live in San Diego, I sent myself a resupply package for the following four days from Mount Laguna to Warner Springs. And it worked out perfectly. So um, just, you can think like that, you know, and, and, and so just, just kind of be conservative with your miles early on is what I'm saying. All right, so the next subject I want to talk about is actually test out your gear and, and test it out multiple times because even if you're a millionaire and you have the top of line, whatever's perceived as the top of line, everything, 
that doesn't mean that it's going to work for you or that you like it. And I, I see so much on trail early on. Um, in my through hike, I got to Hauser Creek, which is 15 mile, 15.4. And that was my 15 mile day. I get there, I'm setting up. And there was a lady there that was taking her tent out of the bag. It still had this, the tags on and everything. And she was reading the instructions on how to set it up. And it took her like an hour to set up her tent because she didn't know how to do it. And I was just thinking, <laughs> and so it's, it's this, it's the see if, if it works for you, if it's the right size and it does what you want, uh, all your gear. And um, also, uh, some things fail right away. So you want to see if they fail. I mean, you might get a stove that doesn't even work. You don't know. So you need to try them out. So just definitely do that. And and the other reason why you want to uh, try the stuff out, like I said, is for failure. I had I had tested all my stuff out and I was good to go. I had so much failure in the desert. I had two air mattress go. My air pillow I had for three years. Uh, went flat and went bad on the very first night at Hauser Creek. So it was like I had that for three years and the first night on my through hike, it went flat. So I bundled up close. And I even had, uh, I had the Big Agnes uh, Tiger Wall UL2 and at Hiker, Hiker Town, I had one of the poles snap. And so that was a big, huge, I had to kind of jerry-rig it and call them and uh, had them, they actually warrantied the one little piece of, of the pole and I had to have it sent ahead of to me about, I don't even know, about three weeks ahead because they were slow. And so I had to deal with kind of jerry rig pole sticking out of my pack for about three weeks, which is weird. Um, so, but anyway, so I dealt with it, but I had a lot of failures. So that's why you want to try this stuff out, make sure everything works and that you like it and you have time to switch it out if you need to. You know, I was thinking about it and section A is a terrific section to start a through hike on. Uh, I've done the entire desert and then when I flipped because of the snow and started coming southbound, I did about 300 miles um, of Washington. So I've done about half of Washington. And then last, that was in 2019. And then last year I went and did about almost 300 miles in Oregon on the trail. And so I've seen a lot of sections so far and it's a terrific one. I mean, if you're not in great shape, it's going to seem a little hard to you. But what it's it's a great one. There's some climbs, some small climbs, a lot of level uh, downhill. You know, like uh, overall, the trail is not very hard in Section A, and really compared to what you're going to see the rest of the desert, it's a very uh, smooth, less difficult section of trail. So uh, I just want to say that it's a great section for you guys to start on and to get the confidence going and you know learn what you need to do to to make it all the way. The next thing I want to talk about is base weight, which. You can argue with people to your blue in the face and there is no right or wrong but i the thing i did learn is within reason go as light as possible you know when you go on a weekend trip like when i go on a weekend trip i'll throw in my um uh a, maybe even a book something like that or you know a little thing of whiskey or just like things that i would never bring on a long trail but when you're on a through hike it really matters so you know carry the weight on things that matter if you need a heavier sleeping bag to stay warm you know, a better tent, things like that, or a pack that's comfortable for you to carry that stuff. But, and the things that um, you can, you want to go as light as you can. And I'll give you an example. I just grabbed something right here. If some people, somebody I'll hike with carried a bunch of these Nalgene bottles. They're heavy. This is about four to five ounces. And instead, use a smart water bottle, which is like a half ounce. I mean, you know, when you carry two to four or six of these, however, however many you carry, uh, that adds up. So even the container, you know, you want to go light. I know this kind of seems like common sense to most people, but it's not to everybody. And these are these will last a long time, and they're easily replaceable on trail. So, um, you know, just start using your noggin uh, where you can cut the weight that an area that doesn't matter, and um, you'll be much happier in the end. I also want to show you, I made a rookie mistake. I was very experienced on the PCT, as I said, when I got on my through hike. And at the last minute, I did what you should never do, and I started throwing things in. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I do uh, cook, you know, I boil water and cook my food, but I'm going to get, um, you know, Dixie carries one of these, so I'm going to carry one. So at the last one, I got one of these and threw it in my kit, threw that in there. Uh, I had an ace bandage in case I got hurt and turned out later on I broke my ankle. But then I went out and bought this headband to kind of keep my ears warm, you know, if it was like a cool day. And I actually had waterproof matches, and they came from my camping kit. And I don't know how they ended up in my backpack, but I was like, oh, yeah, I'll just bring those. It's ridiculous. And uh, this is my balaclava. This thing is a skull crusher. It was too tight for me, but uh, I thought, well, this will keep me warm at night when I'm sleeping. Never did. I couldn't wear it. It was too tight. Um, I had a bunch. I had a notepad. I was going to make notes of the what mile marker to what mile marker and all this and a pencil and a ziploc bag and a whole bunch of other things i threw in like 10 things in my pack at the last minute i bet you they added up to 
two pounds, three pounds, I don't know what it was. And um, so what I'll say to you about uh, base weight is, there's a couple thinkings about this is, and this is what I have learned is not just, it's not just about weight. It's like when you bring things that you barely ever use, all this stuff, I've got to touch this every single day in my pack. Every time I pack up my stuff or I, I want to get, get in my pack to get something or I grab in the stretchy pouch in the front to get something, all these things are generally in the way. You have to move them, you have to touch them, you have to account for them. And I've just learned, you'll just learn if you haven't done a through hike that you'll simplify things as you go and you won't need hardly any of the stuff. You know, I had a beanie. I don't know what I needed the earmuffs for. I have a beanie. These are two things I don't need. So uh, just be very smart. If it's important to you, it's a luxury item, bring it. But just try your best not to bring a bunch of stuff that you might touch once every two, three weeks. It's just not necessary. And, uh, you know, I mean, I guess the best thing is, you know, what I did was I got to Warner Springs after a week. I told you it took me a week. I just uh, I had my buddy Robot was meeting me there anyway and brought me some Trail Magic, brought me a pizza because we're local. And I gave him all this stuff. I said, take it. Take it away from me. So um, just keep that in mind. Uh, next, I want to talk about animals and specifically for the first 100 miles. The really the only thing you're going to see is possibly a rattlesnake. Um, I've seen a zillion of them. I still don't like them, but uh, I, I decided that, you know, and if you add later in the trail, you know, I saw three bear. I have never seen a mountain, thank goodness. But uh, I think what you should do is, uh, is read up and study how to act towards them. Rattlesnakes, and that's one of the things like, you know, a lot of, a lot of the kids, younger kids on the trail want to listen to music and blaster. You should have one ear out, uh, earbud out at all times. Not only have the slow hikers or faster hikers coming by you say, excuse me, let you over. Oh, I've been behind people and they won't let me over and they don't know I'm there and they can't hear me. But also for rattlesnakes, <clears throat> and you have to remember that rattlesnakes are small and they're scared of us. They don't want any part of you. That's why they're rattling. So I've never had one be aggressive towards me ever. Uh, but you can hear them right away. So just maybe learn how to act towards them and especially bear and mountain lion, just how to act when you encounter one. And uh, it'll make you feel more comfortable and be a lot, a lot safer. All right, next topic up is weather. And uh, this is early March of 2021 and up in Mount Laguna, I'm in the Anzabrega Desert about, I don't know, 30 miles uh, east of Jillian down, in, you know, it's a little warmer, but um, <clears throat> It's been dumping snow there. It's uh, the 11th of March right now, and it's dumping, dumping snow. All the hikers that are going early have had to just bail and get somewhere and get a room and get off. But the temperatures in the spring in the desert can get just crazy. And um, if I can give you the range, you know, depending if you go, obviously it depends if you go March, April, there's a lot of rain, it seems like. I went March 26 on my year, and it rained, it sprinkled on us three times the whole 702 miles of the desert. So the people after us, I watched people's vlogs after and it poured on them and it sleeted and it snowed. So I guess it's the April shower thing, but just be prepared. Uh, my first 10 days on trail, so even past section A, it got down into the uh, middle to high 30s every single night, so very cold. But it was clear and sunny and got to be, you know, 60 to 70 in the day, so it was nice. And I got lucky, I didn't have any uh, bad weather the whole desert, like really bad weather. Also, the high can be up there. Uh, I would say that. The whole desert, there was times when it got into the mid 80s. If you go later, and remember I went March 26th, so I got to Kennedy Meadows uh, May 16th, which was too early, but I got there May 16th. Those of you that are leaving later and want to try to get there, you know, mid-June when you go right into the Sierras, you're going to hit some really hot temperatures. So uh, just be prepared for it. You know, you're going to have to learn how to do uh, 10 miles by 10 a.m. Maybe you take siesta in the middle of the day and then hike later in the day or at night so you don't use so much water. So you're going to have to learn a strategy. Um, I didn't have to worry about that. I'm an early riser. I got up and went and I would hike my 20 miles by hopefully, you know, four or five, six o'clock and then try to get a campsite before they were all taken. So uh, that was my style. You probably heard of the term tramley, but that is a trail family and that's a hiker term. Um, I would say that a lot of people do uh, match up in the first uh, section A. I mean, it does happen a lot. I know it did for me. I kind of hiked with different people for a while, but I ended up with the original people that actually I finished the desert with the two young men that I actually started on the first day with. We didn't know each other, but we started on the first day, so it's pretty cool. But um, yeah, tramleys, you know, some people want to do a solo kind of solitary kind of uh, hike, but I think it's human nature to want to uh, hike with other people and also, um, you know, feel a little safer. So uh, yeah, definitely look for it. You know, what's great about it is if you start solo, which I remember I told you, uh, 
65% start solo, uh, you're able to leave if there's any issues with fellow hikers or you know somebody's taking over the group or not getting along or being difficult. You can, if you're not, you didn't start with them, you can just take off and hike your own hike as that, that saying goes, and then hopefully get another, another family. All right, the next very, very important uh, topic in the whole desert, but especially section A when you're learning how to do it is water. I think the key to this is many people I even hike with to this day don't know how much water they drink. Uh, I knew in 2019 on a not hot day and not a cold day, a normal day, uh, how many liters per mile. I was a one liter for every five miles. And why you need to know that is if you come up to a water source and just say you are a one liter for every five miles person like me, when you get to the water source and you have 10, you look on gut hook and you have 10 more miles to the next water, then you know you need to carry at least two liters of water. Um, the other thing that's very wise to do is to camel up. And if you don't know what that means, basically get to the water source, you get your two liters for that next 10 miles, but you also drink another liter to get it in your body. And uh, it's just, it'll benefit you in so many ways. Um, and it's funny because, you know, they always, people tell us we have to drink so much water. I never drank enough water until I got on trail and I felt great. Even my skin looked good. Everything was good drinking that much water. So just keep that in mind. Oh, and one more part on that is, you know, uh, I would say that, I don't know if I had to guess, 60, 65% of the time when I camped, it was dry camping, which means there's no water source by me. So, you know, you ha when you're at a water source before you get to your camp for that night where you think you're going to camp, remember, you need the water to hike to camp and the next morning to where the next water is, but you also need what water you need for cooking. And I personally like to have water in the tent when I could and just sip on it at night. Uh, I felt like that's a good way to get your body rehydrated is at night. Like if you just woke up and rolled over, you could take some sips of water and you could drink like a half a liter to a liter at night. And that's, that's once again, like kind of like cameling up and get it in your body. And I felt like that kind of rehydrated my body and ready for the next day. So just make sure you have enough for dinner and sipping if you want and all that. And then also for what you need to hike. All right. The next very important topic is resupply and, um, people get anal. I know for me trying to figure out where to send my resupply for the whole entire trail drove me nuts. And then the planning and getting the, the USPS boxes and labeling them all. And I had a friend, robot, send them to me. So I had to make a master Excel spreadsheet and I had to make all the labels for it. And I had to put stickers on the box so I could recognize mine over everybody else's, which is important to do, by the way. Put taper or colorful taper stickers. And um, then I had to fill them. I had to figure out how many days of food to put in this box to get me to that next town where there was resupply. So it was like a whole thing. And I had to go shop for all that. But you're only doing section A is what we're talking about. So if I can give you the best tip ever is you do not have hiker hunger, at least in section A. It took me about, I don't even know, 300 miles to even start to get really hungry. But when you're exerting that much energy, you're not gonna feel like eating. A lot of times I went to dinner, got, got to the tent at night to camp and I just didn't feel like eating. So just know that so many people carry so much weight in food. And remember, you're starting out your hike. You're, if you're theoretically not in through hiking shape yet, and if you haven't trained much, you're getting used to your pack and all that stuff. And if you carry all this extra food for no reason, then it's just going to wear you down even more. So be smart about it. Carry enough. But I wouldn't throw in all the extra stuff that you think you're going to need. You can always... Uh, supplement like when you get to lake marina if you didn't bring enough food you know they have a store you can resupply in and so does mount laguna so does julian you know so does ranchita so just just remember to bring the right amount of food with calories and things that you like but also don't overdo it you're just not going to eat for you're not going to have the hunger hunger for a long time the other thing is i think that most of us probably i think in the survey like 95 percent or 99 percent of people have smartphones so definitely if you don't have it invest in the entire pacific crest trail gut hooks app it's it's a marvelous thing if you don't know this because i've seen the question on um, facebook and is it does not need a uh, service or cell service to work it talks to satellites so what we what i do is because i i vlog with my cell phone so i burn my phone down faster and i carry extra batteries and all that but what i do is every, most of the hikers put their phones on airplane modes so you won't get a text you won't get email plus plus a lot of times there's no service anyway if you turn that off um then you you won't burn your battery down. So um, it still works. And then the last thing I'll say about gut hook is as you, as you use it is please, please, please leave comments as you get water and campsites and anything that's important. So I started March 26 on my through hike, which means there was hikers starting on March 1st. So there was three weeks, more than three weeks of hikers going before me. And literally, except for one person, nobody was leaving comments. And so um, 
you know, we're, we're a community out there. We're supposed to help each other. And, you know, you can say, no, was there water or was not water? But if there's water, say how fast it's flowing. Is it about to dry out? Things like that. It really, really helps. You could actually save a life with somebody that, um, there's no comments and he, and he saw that there's water there on the comments of the year before and they, they count on it and there's no water there. They could get in, in a dangerous situation. So just, you know, help your fellow hikers, leave comments, and uh, that's what the app's for. So the last thing I want to talk about uh, of my bullet points is trail maintenance. Now, um, you know, I attempted my through hike in 2019 and the trail was in decent shape uh, overall except for a couple areas, but it was in, it had been trail maintained for, for all the years before that. But in 2020, they stopped and I don't, and they didn't do, haven't done it this year either. So it's basically two winter seasons of uh, no trail maintenance. Hopefully they, they get back on it this year, but I don't know if they want the crews working together when it comes to COVID and maybe spreading COVID. That was the reason why they weren't uh, doing trail maintenance. But like, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I, I attempted my through hike in 2019, went back, uh, last year 2020 and went to ashland oregon and was going to do about 750 miles I ended up just doing about 300 miles but i was mostly solo and there were so many blow downs and there's just trees everywhere and uh, part of it is oregon has had a lot of fires and the trees uh, just fall over eventually you know when they're dead uh, but it was an incredible amount and actually because i was hiking solo for most of that area i actually started counting and i did i did it i did 283 miles in 12 days and i counted 737 uh blowdowns so fallen trees that i had to go up around over through and a lot of them i could step over but a lot of them were just i mean i'm talking like just piled on top of each other where they knocked each other down and i mean talking four and five high and it was quite an ordeal so um the reason why i'm bringing this up is not to be negative but that that you you're gonna have to count for uh you not in some sections not be able to do big miles and that also could play into you obviously you don't know where sections are rough or not but you know make sure you carry enough food in some areas not too much but um it could definitely make you hike a lot slower and less miles uh we just did a three-day uh just a section hike from big bear southbound to whitewater preserve and and nobody's touched that area for a while and, and we didn't see an incredible amount of blowdowns, but the trail was rough. Uh, not only were there a bunch of just, you know, sticks and logs and things blown over and trees and things like that, um, but even just the, the trail overgrowing in the desert, there's some really sharp, not just the cactus, but there's bushes that look innocent, but they have like razors on them and tear your clothes and your legs up. And a lot of the uh, trails getting encroached just by bushes and branches and, and things like that that's normally trimmed back. So it's going to make you uh, slow down and have to take your time to go through there. So just be prepared for that. And another note on that is that because of all the fires last year in 2020, there's going to be a lot of fire reroutes or reroutes you're going to have to create to get around. And that's obviously going to slow you down too. So just be prepared for it. Um, have a good attitude about it. Don't let it get you down. Every year, every class has their own issues. My year was, was El Nino and the incredible snow year just it just screwed up almost everybody's hike so everybody's flipping and jumping and so all this stuff so you know every year it's something so um just know that's that's your plight that year well that about does it for this video and this series so i hope you enjoyed it uh let me know what you thought down below um it was a labor of love it was a lot of work trying to get all these videos put together and finding old video footage for uh for showing you the trail you know the first 100 and 9.5 miles and all that, but it was a labor of love. I enjoyed it. I'm really glad I did it now. Uh, it should be good for hikers for the next at least five years because the trail is not going to change much, at least in Section A. So hopefully it helps you uh, be more comfortable and confident in navigating Section A. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you like the video, like it. And that's about it. Cheers. Until next time, see you down the trail.